In this video, I'm going to talk about um, Ursula Le Guin's It Doesn't Have to Be the Way It Is, which is an essay from a collection that she published just before her death um, called uh, No Time to Spare, and it's a collection of essays. So this, uh, just before I start talking about the text, here's some information about Ursula K. Le Guin. Um, she was born in California in 1929. She died in Oregon in 2018, aged 88. Um, she was an author, she was a teacher, and I write she was a sometime activist, but even um, though her activism was sort of sporadic, it was very effective. She really impacted um, science fiction as a genre, um, but her novels too, I would say, uh, and short stories had an activist um, function in that she was really pushing against established ideas. So, as I say in this next point, her writing regularly challenged cultural conventions and conventions in science fiction. So, for instance, her first book, um, her, her first book, which was written for a young adult audience, um, called The Wizard of Earthsea, introduced to the science fiction world or the fantasy world a hero with red-brown skin and an evil, destructive, invading army um, who were white. In her second novel, The Left Hand of Darkness, gender it, it's set on a planet in which gender is fluid and mostly irrelevant. Um, and so it attributed to human-seeming people completely different constructions of gender and sexuality to the ones that we're used to. Um, she also writes, she wrote a lot about writing, and so, sometimes she wrote about not being ready to tell certain stories at certain times in her life. So, for instance, one of the books that I've assigned to you, um, to Hanu, she, it was the sort of fourth part of a series. You're going to read the second book in the series as well. And she sort of started writing it in the 1970s and couldn't do it. So she didn't have the vocabulary to do it. She waited till 1990 to actually complete that book because sort of she needed the times to catch up with her ideas but she also needed the times to move on to establish the vocabulary um, she needed to be able to tell the story that she wanted to tell so I think that's really interesting for our purposes that um, literature can't get too far ahead of the culture it's just um, we don't have the vocabulary to understand it, or as Le Guin discusses, we don't even have the vocabulary to write it. So that's why I'm sort of pushing this point that literature really reflects our culture. <clears throat> so as I said before, it doesn't have to be the way it is. It's from the collection Known Time to Spare. It's a short essay. It considers what fantasy or imaginative literature or science fiction does, what, what its function is and what its sort of driving ideas. So in order to discuss this, I'm going to choose a few quotations from the text, which I think really encapsulate um, Le Guin's point. So the first one is this, but fantasies, whether, the folk, whether folk tales or sophisticated literature, are stories in the adult demanding sense. They can ignore certain laws of physics, but not of causality. They start here and go there or back here. And though the mode of travel may be unusual and here and there may be wildly exotic and unfamiliar places, yet they must have both a location on the map of that world and a relationship to the map of our world. If not, the hero or the reader of the tale will be set adrift in a sea of inconsequential inconsistencies, or worse yet, left drowning in the shallow puddle of that author's wishful thinking. So I think this is very important, that she's basically saying, just like standard literature, the underpinnings, the foundation of the story have to be familiar. They have to follow certain rules. Um, so they can ignore certain laws of physics, but not of causality is an important point, a sentence in this quotation, in that things have to make sense. Um, and as the next sentence shows, you know, here and there might be wildly exotic and unfamiliar. They have to have a look like they have to be consistent with the world that the author is building and also they have to bear a relationship to the map of our world in other words we need to understand what these things are otherwise we spend our intellectual energies like figuring out what these are rather than following the narrative so just like in the traditional literatures that you've read a lot of you know we the narrative the point of the plot is important and so the author has to be very careful 
not to introduce irrelevant details that may send us off in the wrong direction to not pay attention what they want what the author wants us to pay attention to just note my MLA citation that's what we're using in this class um, just the author's last name and the page number so another claim that Le Guin puts forward is that fantasy is subversive. She writes, it doesn't have to be the way it is. It's a playful statement made in the context of fiction with no claim to being real, yet it is a subversive statement. Subversion doesn't suit people who, feeling their adjustment to life has been successful, want things to go on just as they are, or people who need support from authority, assuring them that things are as they have to be. So this, I chose this because this last paragraph really is a description of like various reasons for conservatism. And as we've discussed, canonicity is inherently conservative. It, again, reflects sort of standard um, mores, values of our culture. It doesn't push the envelope. Whereas fantasy and other kinds of subversive literature I, I pose a threat to people who are very successful in the way things are, for example, or, and, and so they don't want anything to change, or people who need these structures of authority assuring them that things are the way they are because they have to be the way they are. They'd like that because there's no alternative, and so there's no, nothing that they could have done about it. I think that's really important for the kind of um, the kinds of uh, conversations that we're having in this class, because we're going to broaden uh, over the course of the semester. We're really going to broaden our conception of what could be a canon and what is anti-canonical, anti or what we might choose to include if we stretch out our definition of a canon. So this is a helpful, re a helpful way of thinking why canons might be limited and sort of if we think of them as necessary, then necessarily small. This quotation extends this idea of sort of resistance to um, subversive ideas. So, and she's talking specifically about fundamentalism, like uh, having a really strict belief structure and how fantasy and imaginative and speculative fiction are really difficult for fundamentalist belief practices. So they get treated as abominations by religious fundamentalism whose rigid, whose rigid reality constructs shudder at contact with questioning. So she's saying that science fiction is inherently questioning. It's saying, why should things be the way they are? And what would happen if we change them? And the nonsense treatment from pragmatic fundamentalists who want to restrict reality to the immediately perceptible and the immediately profitable. So she's basically like it's dismissed by pragmatic fundamentalists like saying that's nonsense there's no reason for us to consider that those who dismiss fantasy less fiercely from a less absolute absolutist stance usually call it dreaming or escapism and they really question why we should do this but i sort of i i hold firmly to the tenet that if we don't tell these different stories we're always stuck in a uh, in a really lacking present. We have to just suck up the things that we don't like. Whereas if we can imagine different futures, then we can change them. And so I see speculative fiction as ways of figuring out ideas that can help us really change the future. So this is the final point that I want to bring up. We can't really question reality directly, only by questioning our conventions, so we see it connected to what we talked about with the Levis, our belief, our orthodoxy, our construction of reality. As all Galileo said, all Darwin said was, it doesn't have to be the way we thought it was. So that's a little bit of a different um, take on the title. The title's up in the pink letters on top. It doesn't have to be the way we thought it was means that the future can be different from the past. The way we understand our future can be different from the past. So to finish, and this is going to guide our class discussion next Tuesday, but also this is sort of how I want you to finish video blogs because what I'm asking for in the video blogs is you spark a conversation in a comment section is I have some questions that came up as I was looking at these. So looking at Le Guin's discussion of fundamentalism, consider how it connects to Levis' project, that is what Levis is trying to do in the great tradition. And it's an open-ended question. It says, what connections do you see? 
The next question is how might Le Guin's point quoted in the previous si slide, the one about um, all Galileo did and all Darwin did say, was to say it doesn't have to be the way we thought it was. How does that connect to the literary canon? So sort of the clue is the conventions thing, like we can, what we're doing in the class is questioning the conventions that construct our canon. And what other texts or genres of texts that you've read push against, that's an extra that, um, push against the canonical texts that leave us, for instance, lists. And so we're going to spend some time next Tuesday really talking about the particular authors that he works with and how do they push against them. So think of a genre of texts or a genre or just a single text, if you like, how it pushes against canonical conventions. Okay, so that's sort of the structure. It's not very complicated, but I want you to basically give a rundown of the basic ideas in the um, in the text that you're doing your video of, and then sort of pull out some points that. Um, oh, first of all, it started with a little bio, and I think that's uh, useful. And then sort of main ideas of what the author is arguing for, the claims that they're making, and then some contextualization. So what you think is important for the larger project that we're pursuing in the class. And finally, I want you to come up with three questions for your peers to answer as they look for the comments. Okay, we'll talk more about it on Tuesday, but that's the general idea. Okay.